All right, so this morning in James chapter three, we're gonna see two things. We're gonna look at words and wisdom. You might call it your tongue and your conduct. And see, everything that we speak, we were told by Jesus in Matthew 15, 18, those things which proceed out of the mouth, they come from the heart and they defile a man. (laughs) And see, our speech serves to reveal what is happening inside here, amen? (laughs) And see, Jesus says, what comes out, it's gonna reveal what is sincerely in here. And see, what that means is we as new creations in Jesus Christ, we need a heart change if we want a tongue change, (laughs) if we want a speech change. It has to come through the sincere faith in Jesus Christ who when we believe according to Ephesians 1, he gives us his Holy Spirit as a seal and guarantee who resides in us, fills us to the point of overflow to glorify the Lord and as we yield to the Spirit, maybe there's hope yet. (laughs) for this unruly tongue that is a world of iniquity, according to chapter three. (laughs) And so, again, we're gonna jump right into it. Look at James chapter three, verse one and two. It says, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. (laughs) This morning, we start with the scariest verse for me as the pastor teacher of Calvary Chapel McKinney. Did you see what this says here? My brethren, he's writing to the people. He says, let me tell you, I know everyone wants to be a teacher. So many of you guys want to be a teacher. Let not many of you become teachers. Why? Because there's a greater judgment that is coming a more strict judgment that is waiting for us. And that word judgment is crema. It means a condemnation, but don't think condemnation in the sense of like absent from salvation. But you need to understand, if you're a teacher of the word of God, which I'll apply it here first to the pastor in the pulpit, I am going to stand before the Lord someday, and I am gonna have to answer for what I taught you. Not only what I taught you from my mouth, but did I live it out with my life? And see, you might walk in this morning and go, dude, this is the first time I'm ever hearing this. Well, when you leave, you're gonna be accountable to answer for the one time you've heard this this morning before the Lord. But I'll tell you, as I studied this this week, I think I read this passage some 10, 11, 12 times. It makes me now 10, 11, or 12 times more responsible to walk this thing out. And see, I start here at the pastor at the pulpit here, but see, Jesus said in Luke 12, 48, he said, but he who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. (laughs) Let me ask you, you don't have to show by hands, (laughs) but if you're a regular church attendee, if this is your church, I know for a fact you get the Bible verse by verse every week. (laughs) Now you might not say, well, I'm not a teacher, I'm not on the stage. Can I tell you what you do with your life everywhere you go as you tell people that you're a Christian? You're teaching them what it is to be a Christian. And see, when the Lord gives you the word this morning on taming your tongue, when you leave this place, you're now responsible to say, am I willing to submit to the Lord all of the things of my life to say, man, I'm gonna be an example, a shining bright vessel that people can look at and go, man, that's what the Lord does in the life of people who trust in him. Or, and this is always alarming to me again as a formal true teacher, (laughs) Jesus told the religious leaders who used to parade themselves as the authorities in the word, right? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, all of these men that would walk around and do these things, the scribes. He said in Matthew 23, 14, he said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Which, by the way, Jesus sometimes had to call it like it is. You see that? (laughs) Jesus didn't say, hey, that's okay, guys. Just keep doing what you're doing. He said, you're being hypocrites. You study the word all day. You devour widows' houses, and for a pretense, you make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. You are gonna be responsible before the Lord. You walked around and paraded yourself as these great teachers, knowledgeable of the word, and Jesus said, you're binding everyone with these things, these heavy burdens. But you know what he said they wouldn't do? They wouldn't even lift it with one of their little fingers. They wouldn't come touch the things they were laying upon everyone else. What great condemnation in telling people, you need to live like this because that's what the word says and then I don't live it out. That's a hard word, but it is a sobering reminder 
that we have a great responsibility, a stewardship in the Lord. And I will tell you, you may sit in here and say, okay, I actually do want to be a teacher of the word of God. <laughs> Can I just tell you, praise the Lord for that call if it's of the Lord. Amen? Let me tell you, it's important. Don't run from the call of the Lord. What many people will do is go, man, I don't like verse one of chapter three. I don't want greater a condemnation, greater judgment. I will just not step into the calling. No, <laughs> step into the calling that the Lord has for your life, but submit to the Lord in your calling, amen? If you submit to the Lord, he's gonna use you for great things, but we must understand that Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, every idle word that a man speaks, he's gonna have to give account of it in the day of judgment. <laughs> That's terrifying. I don't know about you guys. Every idle word. <laughs> and you say, well, wait a minute, condemnation. Am I gonna lose salvation for the way that I speak in the Lord? Let me tell you what we're talking about here. There is a judgment seat of Jesus Christ in 2 Corinthians 5.10 called the Bema judgment seat, right? And now this is not a judgment that says, are you a believer or are you not? We come into heaven not because of our tongue, but because of the completed work of Jesus Christ upon a cross, amen? Let's amen that again. Amen? amen. Thank you. I just want to make sure we understand this is not a works-based gospel. It's not a works-based doctrine. But we talked about this in chapter two. <laughs> when you seerly believe something, you're going to live it out. <laughs> you're going to observe those things in your life as laws, as rules. You're not saved by them, but you respond according to the grace that God has poured out upon you Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15 to present himself approved to God, being a worker who diligently and rightly divides the word of truth. We're told in 1 Peter 3.15 that we should always have an answer ready for people that come and ask for the reason that is the hope in our hearts. Are we rightly dividing the word in our personal time? Are we proclaiming it in spirit and in truth, coming out of our heart the word of God and living it out in action? And see, it's important that as we speak these things, we understand that someday we will stand before the Lord and he'll say, I stewarded you with these things. What did you do with them? Did you run from them because you were afraid of your master? Or did you step into them and submit to the rule of your master to glorify him in all things? But it's interesting because James says in verse two, he says, for we all stumble in many things. <laughs> I love James's honesty here. The word stumble, pataio, it means to err into sin. 1 John 1.8 says, don't let anyone say they don't have sin. If they do, they deceive themselves. That's written to believers. <laughs> now, you may have heard, you come to Jesus, you're just perfect now. There's no more sin in your life. If that's the case, man, you should be up here teaching this study this morning, right? The reality is we are redeemed by the Lord. We are saved by grace. But I will tell you, we will still stumble at times. We will fall short of the goal. We are told in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, I believe it is, be holy as God is holy. Do you still think you're perfect compared to God's holiness? <laughs> that sets a bar that I cannot attain and achieve in this tent, in this body. But my desire is that I would aim for that bar, that I would desire to discipline my body. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 7, he says, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Think about what Paul's saying in that section. I try to do everything I can to live above reproach as a pastor teacher as a man that's telling people the gospel because what would be the worst thing is if I brought a bunch of people into the kingdom, but then when I walk into that kingdom, Lord says, man, you disqualified yourself in the way you were acting. You were filling that role as a pastor teacher, but it was in the power of your flesh. You weren't yielding to me as your master. And see, people hear that and they're like, man, that sounds like legalism. <laughs> this is the proper response to the fact that Jesus is your savior and your Lord. You say, man, my desire is to glorify him in everything that I do. That though I may have a liberty here in this thing, if someone's gonna be stumbled by that liberty, man, I'm gonna discipline myself in that thing. Why? Because I'm a teacher who has a stricter judgment that's coming. And see, people go, well, if that's the case, I don't wanna have to be a teacher. Let me remind you, <laughs> your life is professing that you belong to Jesus Christ. And everything that you're doing, everything that you're saying, can I tell you, you are a testimony to people around you. <laughs> Are you gonna be a testimony that says, man, the Lord is able to change wicked hearts, wicked tongues? <laughs> or will people say, man, that's exactly what I thought church was? A bunch of people saying to do things, 
but they aren't changed at all. There's no sincerity. There's no fruit that's coming out. And God forbid that happened for here, from here at the pulpit. <laughs> but I'll tell you what James says is we all sin, we all stumble. He says, but the reality is if you're perfect, you're gonna be able to bridle the whole body. <laughs> See, if you, if you don't stumble in word, if you can control your tongue, you are gonna be perfect. But this raises the level. You know how you can measure if you're perfect? If your tongue is perfect. Yeah, we should giggle a little bit. <laughs> Everyone in here just went, oh no, I'm not perfect anymore. Because you will say things. I had, okay, this happens every week. Let me tell you what happens every week. Whatever study we're teaching, someone in the body gets to live the study, I feel like. You're like, what are we talking about? When you're talking about storms and trials, someone calls me and they say, I'm going through the storm and trial. Sometimes it's me myself going through the things that I'm about to teach. But I feel like someone is always living the study the week of and they're calling and I'm counseling from the very scripture. This week, I feel like, man, there were so many times where I'm like, I think I'm that guy with the tongue thing, right? And I'll be honest with you, I think all of us would feel that way if we were teaching this section in humility. Because man, it takes one little thing <laughs> to come up. And let me be clear, when I'm talking about tongue, we talked about it a couple weeks ago, I'm not just talking about like, oopsies, I said a bad word. Look at, I'm talking beyond vocabulary. I'm talking about the, the sentiments that come out of my mouth that express something like, where is your faith right now? When things go wrong in my life and I start to go, oh, this is it, this is the end. Everything's done, Lord. <laughs> what is wrong with your tongue? <laughs> You need to yield to the spirit who guides you into all peace and will guide you into all truth. And see, this week there were moments where I would even say things, there were other times when I'd say something, I'm like, that's not even what I mean right now. <laughs> Ask my wife, right? No, when I say something and I'm like, this is what I imagine I'm saying, then it comes out totally in a way that's like, man, that didn't make as much sense as I hoped it would. There's a reality that this oral communication is the worst format of communication in the world. Let me explain this. If I wanted to write you a letter expressing my heart, you know what happens if I type something that's a little funny and ah, it doesn't really make sense? I just backspace that thing. <laughs> I can cut, I can copy, I can paste, I can move, I can shift. You don't get that with your mouth. Do you remember in James 1, it said, man, be slow to speak. Why? Because man, that tongue is ready to go all the time. <laughs> that tongue has to be held behind two pearl cages, right? <laughs> because that monster is ready to come out and destroy everything. <laughs> and it's been said, you have two ears, one mouth, use them correspondingly, right? And proportionally. <laughs> man, I would hear before I speak, and it's just a reminder, man, we have to make sure that we're taking account for the things that we're saying. How do we make sure they're the right things? Yield to the Holy Spirit. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? This is funny, this isn't just a speech thing. I've experienced this on social media. I have a response typed out, and I go, I am gonna disprove this person, make him look stupid, watch this. <laughs> and then the Holy Spirit says, what are you doing right now? Backspace, 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 right? <laughs> and what am I gonna do all day? Sit around and argue with some stranger on the internet about something that doesn't matter at all, that doesn't change the truth of the Bible, by the way. I will tell you, I'm not saying you can't have a ministry somewhere online, but be, man, talk about, you have a ministry in your house and your children, and your wife, brothers and sisters in the church, you have people to pour into and you can have discussions with. I think it's a, a tempting thing to get into arguments with people on a keyboard because there's a separation. But man, I've seen some wicked things come out of good people on the internet. And I go, man, I don't want to be like that. I know I have been that guy. I can't be that guy anymore because there's a stricter judgment. Amen? But also in the way that I speak in general. Man, where's my tone as a believer? Things that I was just absolutely convicted of this week at different times of like, man, that's not new, that's not new creation, thoughts. <laughs> Let me be clear, the words might sound like new creation. We have a way as Christians, by the way. I can make things sound real churched up and holy. <laughs> but then it, what comes out, you go, oh, there's venom in there. There's something in there that shouldn't be there. And that should lead us to run and repent as 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen? Look at three through five. It says, indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. 
So we've addressed the issue. James says, hey, you got to work on taming that tongue. Now, again, this is not going to be a work of us. It's a work of the Lord through the power of the Spirit as we yield to that. But in this section, what he's conveying is the power of the tongue. And so he starts using imagery here. And in verse 3, he begins with these horses. And it's funny because we're in Texas now, right? We see horses a lot more often for us transplants. We didn't see a lot of horses maybe in California. But now you see them. And I don't know if you've been real close to a horse, but those things are huge. (laughs) They're big animals. They're like all muscle, and they're strong, and they're fast, and they move all over. And I'll tell you, there's something terrifying about the idea of someone walked up to me. I don't think I've ever truly ridden a horse. Maybe as a kid, like, at the fair or something, right? No, that doesn't count. I've never ridden a wild horse or a big horse, right? That would be terrifying if someone said, hey, get on that thing. Like, no, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Is this thing, like, trained? Is it broken? Like, what do we do? And it says here that the way you control these big, majestic, wild steeds <laughs> is you take this bit and you put it in their mouth that you can turn their whole body <laughs> He says they'll obey you when you put this bit in their mouth with the, the reins and you can control the direction. You actually can tame that horse, that big, powerful thing, by controlling its mouth. <laughs> the power of the mouth on that horse <laughs> if you can get that thing under control. And then we talk about ships in verse 4. He says these big, giant ships, huge vessels. Imagine in Paul, or I'm sorry, James's day, Paul's day too, I guess, but you know what I mean, these big ships out in the ocean. And you're like, man, that is the form of transportation of that day. That's the way we can get around, we can put things from one place to another. A really useful, awesome thing when it is controlled properly. (laughs) But see, that ship, that big, glorious ship that has these big sails that's driven by fierce winds, it's controlled by the pilot that's back there with this little tiny rudder in the back. (laughs) If he lets go of that rudder, The fierce winds that drive it, whatever way the winds decide, the winds of life will take it into something and it'll absolutely destroy it. Unless there's a pilot back there who says, man, I'm going to control this thing properly. And see, this is important because all this is saying that, man, this tongue that we have in our mouth, (laughs) it seems like such a small, insignificant thing. Don't we all feel that way to some extent when we think about our words? We're like, oh, my bad, I just said something dumb, that's all. I just said something offensive. No big deal. It's not like I did anything. No, there's something sick about this because what comes out of our mouth is what's in our heart. (laughs) And see, the things that we say, the things that we speak about and speak out, now don't hear this as a manifestation thing. That's not where I'm going with this. What I'm saying is when you speak something wicked and evil, man, people go, that is not... Good, that's destructive. And I will tell you, if you walk around as a believer and you're you're constantly have venomous speech, can I just tell you what happens? People are not going to be around you. (laughs) It's very practical. If all you can do is complain about everything in your life, if all you can do is just be bitter about everyone else and everything else, I'm just telling you, you're going to be limited in ministering for the Lord. Practically, because pe- people don't trust you, they don't follow you. You're not a good leader if you're just walking around bad mouthing everybody. But also, <laughs> I think the Lord says, Man, you haven't been trusted with this little thing. How can I give you this over here? You got to start with these things, and it seems so little. But the Lord says, No, it's a powerful thing. We're told in Proverbs 21 23, whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. <laughs> I'm going to ask the husbands in here. <laughs> How much trouble could you avoid it if you didn't say that thing, right? The people that drove in here arguing in the car on the way to church and reached the holy ground that is the church, and now for an hour you have peace in your family, okay? When you get back in the car, reality's going to be like, man, I shouldn't have said that dumb thing at nine this morning, right? I'm going to pick on the husband. Sorry, that's what it is. I don't know. Maybe that goes the other way, but man, my wife's good like that. I don't know. I'm the one that's always messing those things up. So (laughs) the reality is, though, you guard your mouth, Man, you're going to save yourself a lot of things. I've seen this in the corporate world. People say something and they keep saying it. It works its way to the top and eventually you have a tough work environment. (laughs) And especially when it's not true stuff. Especially when it's just you're bitter, you're mad, you don't want to submit, you don't want to yield. Man, that can create absolute misery in the workplace. (laughs) Remember, I haven't always been in ministry. I know those, those office politics and dynamics. Man, God forbid that the Christian be the one known in the office as the gossip and slanderer. It shouldn't be the case, amen? You have a mission field, by the way, at your office. (laughs) 
You might say, man, I'm just calling for the Lord to bring me into ministry. I prayed that for years, and then the Lord revealed to me, this is your ministry. You have 35 people sitting at cubicles around you in offices that don't know me. How are you representing me in this dark place? (laughs) And man, I was so convicted because I was like, man, I do a great job at church, but what am I doing in the workplace with the unbelievers around me? It's so easy to be loud, shiny, and bright around fellow believers in the echo chamber. (laughs) But when you go into the dark world, man, are we misrepresenting the Lord? Are we buying into the bitterness, the envy, the backstabbing, all that stuff that can be there? I hope we're not. (laughs) But it says in verse five, the final illustration he gives, he says, even so the tongue is a little member, boasts great things. He says, see how great a forest, a little fire kindles. (laughs) The potency of the tongue He says, man, imagine going out. If you guys, again, California people, we know about wildfires. Actually, the panhandle right now, right? A lot of fires happening. That doesn't start because a big blaze immediately begins. It starts with a spark. It starts with a spark, and it just goes wild. And he says, the tongue is like that. You think, this insignificant thing I'm about to say, but who cares, whatever. The Lord's telling me not to say it. I'm just going to say it anyways. (laughs) And then you watch it go, and you're like, oh, no. (laughs) Here it goes. It's burning down everything. And see, it's funny because your response to this might be, you know what I'll do? I'll just never speak again. (laughs) You know that's not what the Lord's called you to, right? The Lord has called you to be quick to hear, slow to speak, but he never called you to be quiet as a believer. And see, the important thing here is to say, think about the horse, the ship, and fire. Great power in all of those. But if they're not trained and tamed, and kept in their proper environment, if the fire is not kept in the fireplace and gets on the carpet in the living room, it's destructive, amen? But man, if you can keep that thing controlled, you can cook with it, you can be warm by it. You get a horse that is trained, man, you don't have to walk in James's day. That's like, man, I can get around, I can do ministry riding this horse places. The ship, I can go from place to place and travel and minister and I can speak, but these things have to be controlled rightly. And now again, you might say, okay, so how do we do this in our own strength? I love, just like the ship has that pilot on the rudder, we need the Holy Spirit piloting the things that we say. We need the Holy Spirit guiding us to say, don't use that power in a reckless way. Harness that power of your tongue to glorify the Lord in the way that you live. You see, Proverbs 18, 21, it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those who love it will eat its fruit. So you might hear the section be like, man, the tongue is just deadly, that's it. No, death and life are in the power of the tongue for two reasons. Remember, it says in Romans, it says, how will they hear the gospel unless there's a preacher to proclaim it to them? You need a mouth to proclaim it, amen? But it also, we need to remember that there's life in the profession with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord. It's a profession of the mouth, a belief of the heart. You must use the tongue to call upon the name of the Lord, so to speak. The things that come out of the heart, that speech can actually bring salvation because it's rooted in expressing your saving faith. The tongue can be used for absolute glory or it can be used for absolute harm and destruction. But the reality is, who's who's leading us, who's guiding us, and how is it being used? The last note I want to put on this In the book of Jude, it's a one-chapter book, an incredible letter at the end of the New Testament, right before Revelation. Jude talks about false teachers. And he says they use words, not in a way to where they necessarily speak badly. They do. But there's one thing in there that really gets me. It says that they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. You might just be thinking about bad things right now in the sense of, oh, I can't slander, I can't gossip. We understand that. But there is a wicked heart that can actually sometimes say things that sound nice, but it's just for your selfish gain. That's dangerous. False teachers do these things. It's funny, I think there's a lot of false teachers out there today that say things like, you're good enough. You have the power in yourself to do all these things. They're gaining advantage over you. That's not the message of the gospel. You are not good enough. You need a savior, Jesus Christ, amen? He is the one that is good. But do you know what happens when he fills you with the spirit? (laughs) He redeems you. He calls you into this new life that is good. (laughs) You no longer are walking in darkness, as Ephesians 5, 8 says, but now you're walking in light as children of the light. Part of that walk is your speech. Look at 6 through 8, what happens here. It says, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. (laughs) The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature 
and it is set on fire by hell. If anyone was curious, he's pretty serious here, right? For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil. <laughs> That's a pretty hard word for a Sunday morning, huh? <laughs> we'll all feel really good leaving this place. Let me tell you, don't feel condemned leaving here. You can feel convicted, but the Lord's good with this. He convicts you in his spirit that you run towards it to be refined and be made more like Jesus, amen? This is not a message of condemnation this morning. It's a message of conviction, I see that. But it's gonna prove that, man, things can be done as we yield to the spirit, but without that, that untamed tongue, it's just a world of iniquity. Cosmos adikakia in the Greek. It means a collection of unrighteousness. <laughs> and it stains or blemishes everything else if it's not tamed. See, our temptation is to say, well, if I just go to church, if I just lift my hands during worship, if I dress up nicely, do these things, that's going to make me acceptable for the Lord. And you're like, those are good things. But now, is your tongue tamed by the power of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Because the reality is, you can have everything else seemingly in line, but when you start speaking out stuff that's venomous, that's not true, that is against the word of God, it stains the whole thing. I mean, imagine, these are the same words that we talk about Jesus Christ presenting us with, like blameless without blemish. It's the idea of you had a white wedding dress and this big old stain on it. That would be problematic for the bride, right? This is the idea, we are the bride of Christ. If we speak like this with an untamed tongue, man, it's going to set on fire the course of nature. You're like, what does that mean? One of the translations, I forget which one, maybe NLT, translated it this way. The wheel of life. <laughs> if you go into the Greek, it means basically your very existence, your whole life will be set on fire by the way that you speak. Because here's the reality. What is the word showing? What's in our heart? What's in your heart? actually directs the way you live your life. And so if you have all this terrible stuff coming out of you, your whole world is gonna be falling apart because you're not yielding to the power of the Holy Spirit. Proverbs 16, 27, it says, an ungodly man digs up evil and it's on his lips like a burning fire. <laughs> have you ever been there where you're like, ooh, I have something juicy, <laughs> right? I, like, it's like having uh, like, like money in your pocket. It's burning a hole in your pocket. You gotta spend that money, right? Same thing with that word. You're like, oh, I gotta control this. I can't, I just gotta blurt it out. <laughs> it says, man, that's ungodly man behavior. Man, take it to the Lord, amen? We're so quick to tell everyone else, everyone else's business. But the Lord is here, ready to receive our prayers, to refine us, to guide us, to make us more like him. And it says the tongue, when it's untamed, it's basically it's set on hell by, or, I'm sorry, set on fire by hell. <laughs> that's a tough phrase, <laughs> You ever heard, I mean, maybe you've said this before, before you came to the Lord. You're like, I'm generally a good person. <laughs> he, James would say, yeah, your tongue is set on fire by hell. You're like, no, but I'm generally good. No, you're not. <laughs> you need a heart change. It's gonna change your speech. You need a, to be filled with the spirit. You need to be absolutely made more like Jesus by his spirit. And in verse seven, it says, think about this. Every kind of beast everywhere all over the earth has somehow been tamed at some time. Like, you ever go to the zoo or the aquarium and you're like, that's crazy that they even have this animal in here. You ever thought about that? <laughs> you like go to the Long Beach Aquarium back in the day and you're like, there's this like orca whale. You're like, how do you even get that in here, right? It's incredible. <laughs> it's been somehow tamed and subdued by man. James says, but yet there's still one thing <laughs> that is a wild animal of sorts that can't be tamed by man. <laughs> it's that tongue that's been set on hell or set on fire by hell. <laughs> That is crazy, right? He says, you can't do it. But let me tell you what this reminds me of. Do you remember in Mark 5, the land of the Gadareans, right? There was that demoniac, and he was full of demons, thousands of demons, legion. And they, they said, man, we, they've chained him up, and they locked him away, but he kept breaking out. Man couldn't tame that demoniac. And then you know what happened when Jesus showed up? <laughs> That man was changed, tamed, subdued, and redeemed by Jesus Christ. <laughs> it seemed like there was no hope in Mark 5 until Jesus shows up through the power of the Spirit. He makes that demoniac absolutely unrecognizable in the best way possible. <laughs> 
I remember someone taught that study once and said, imagine the demoniac going back home to his family after Jesus healed him. They probably were like, lock the doors, he's coming, right? Lock the windows. He's like, don't worry, guys, we're good now. It's like, what? <laughs> Maybe you had that experience after coming to Jesus where your friends are like, oh, dude, I'm not picking up that guy's call. I'm not talking to that guy. <laughs> And then you're like, no, man, I just want to like tell you, man, I'm, so, I'm sorry for this, but I love you and I want to pray for you. And they're like, what happened to you? <laughs> I thought you were going to be untamable for the rest of your life, that you would never be subdued like this. The power of the Holy Spirit by faith in Jesus Christ. The same thing that we saw in Mark 5 with that demoniac. And in verse 8, he says again, that untamed tongue, it's an unruly evil, uses this word kakas. It means if left unrestrained, it's going to cause great destruction with great injury. And see, James says that untamed tongue is full of deadly poison, which is the word eos. It relates to the venom of a serpent. When you're compared to a serpent in the Bible, <laughs> do you know who it's comparing you to? Satan, Lucifer. The very first one who came out and with his tongue convinced people away from God. Uh, I was saying in that moment, a false teacher. <laughs> He brought false doctrine. He says, no, God just said that because he knows if you eat that, you're just gonna be made like him. Go ahead and have it. And they walked away from the word of God that they were given and they went and partook in this thing because they were convinced that that was truth and it turned out that that serpent was absolutely <laughs> Satan himself. <laughs> and see, we're told in Ecclesiastes 10, 11, it so poetically reveals the dangers of the untamed tongue. It says, a serpent may bite when it's not charmed or tamed, the babbler is no different. <laughs> That's a funny verse to me. Man, there's something about going to a zoo or you know, walking up at a reptile exhibit and you're like, cool, that, that, that snake is tame right now. It's behind that glass, that diamondback, right? That cobra, whatever it may be. I feel okay with this. The thing's tame to some extent, it's behind the glass. If you were out walking on a path and you saw some copperhead, you're not gonna be like, hey man, let me go walk over and pet that thing and kiss it, right? No, it's gonna bite you and you're gonna get venom. You're gonna die if you don't get treatment, right? There's a problem. He says, do you know that the mouth of the babbler is just like that venom? That man, unless you are tamed, unless you are controlled by the Lord, you're gonna be absolutely deadly in a terrible way, absolutely destructive if you haven't yielded that tongue to the Lord. <laughs> and see, it's, it's wild to me because, again, we kind of write it off as like the least important, least significant thing, and that's why the book of James gives it a whole chapter here. Remember, he said in James 1.26, he said, if any of you think that you're religious, but you don't bridle your tongue, your religion is absolutely useless. It's in vain. You can have all the sacrifices, all the prayers, all the worship, all these things that you think are important, but man, if it is not changing your heart proven by your speech... Maybe you need to take a step back and say, man, has the Lord changed me? Am I yielding to the Lord? Am I yielding to his spirit? Look at verse nine through 12. It says, with it, speaking of the tongue, we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude or likeness of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. He's taking this section about the tongue and he kind of wraps it in this thing where he's revealing the inconsistent nature of the tongue. He says, look, with it we bless our God and Father, which is eulageo, it means to celebrate or to praise, and then you take that same instrument, that tongue, and you use it to curse men. That word there means to invoke doom or evil upon another. And he says, this is just wrong because the men that you're cursing, do you know who created them? God in heaven. I feel like I need to pause it for a minute because this is something that goes from Genesis 1 all the way through the end of the Bible. Do you know you weren't made by accident? Do you know that you weren't created by a bunch of atoms or something crashing into each other and you evolve from like some leech in the, in the water or something, right? You know what I'm saying here. There is an attack on the God of the Bible and the way that's be, that attack is being played out is that, hey, man is nothing more than an animal. You evolved. You know what you should do? Live like an animal. If you want to do something, just do it, right? I think Nike's made a lot of money saying that actually. But the reality is, if you want to do something, just go ahead, what can you help? You're nothing but an animal. 
That is worldly, just ridiculous logic. First of all, from a scientific standpoint, that you have somehow just accidentally landed here and that you stay alive while you sleep without controlling your own breath. There is a Lord who loves you, amen? A God who made you and knit you and according to his own mouth in Genesis 1.27, it says that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. <laughs> Uh-oh, right? Are we gonna talk about it? <laughs> Not only have you been made in the image of God, but you've been made male or female. <laughs> People are like, what about the anomaly of the 0.001% of, stop. <laughs> Let's go make laws based on an anomaly that is, in their own terms, not very scientific and not data worthy of supporting. You have been made in the image of God, either male or female. This world is trying to do everything to convince you otherwise because it is an attack on the Bible. It is an attack on God. It is powered by Satan and demonic. It's wild because 10 years ago, I could have taught the study and moved on. But even in the church, this is wild. People are promoting things like this. Let me be clear. We welcome everyone to walk in these doors. We preach the gospel without partiality to everybody, any color, any, any, any age, anything, right? But when you preach the word, it calls you to understand that you need to yield to the word of God. We're not bending on the word of God. It says what it says. You need to come in and humbly acknowledge that he created you for a purpose. He loves you. He died for you. But man, now he's called you into new life, new wisdom, new truth that is his truth, not the truth of the world. <laughs> I need to keep going. Verse 10, out of the same mouth, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Verse 10 says, out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. And he said, these things should not be so. This is wild because the things that we're saying, <laughs> we say this about God, God is so good. And then our next thing, something changes in someone's circumstance or character, and we're like, oh, God is just hating me right now. I'm so terrible. <laughs> Everything's awful. You're like a minute ago, you just gave God praise, but now you're so upset by the people around you, what they're doing to you or what's been done. And it's wild because Paul charges the believer in Romans 12, 14. He says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. I am never more tempted to curse someone than when they try to persecute me for the truth that we preach in the Bible. <laughs> oh man, is that not the hardest thing to restrain yourself? And I'm not talking about physically, I'm just talking about in your heart. I'm like, oh, I immediately hate that person. It's like, no, pray for that person. You know what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 44? He said, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Again, who in here is perfect this morning? <laughs> I don't do those things. Normally speaking, generally speaking, that's not my first response. <laughs> but you know what the beauty of this is? When your heart, or your flesh, I should say, says, man, I'm gonna respond with this. Man, the Holy Spirit's so good to say, no, no, no. Matthew 5, 44. <laughs> Blessed are the meek. They shall inherit the kingdom, right? They inherit the earth, I should say, Matthew 5, 5. And see, let me be clear. Meekness is not weakness, Amen. We sometimes think if we're meek, we're being weak. Oh, I gotta be loud. I gotta fist fight everyone that doesn't agree with me. Can I just ask you, is the truth of the word of God changing whether you win or lose an argument against someone that doesn't wanna hear it? The word of God stays true. You know the truth. Stand for the truth. But at some point, you have to be able to say, man, I'm gonna pray for you. I don't have to strong arm you and wrestle you right now. I'm gonna pray for you because you're in the same place I once was before I came to Jesus Christ. That's called meekness. You have the power to absolutely do something. And you actually yield and say, no, I'm not gonna do that right now. Now it's interesting, you know who was our example of meekness? Anyone? Jesus, yes. <laughs> That's the easy answer if I ever give you guys that one, okay? Jesus, it's like children's ministry. Just always say Jesus, boys. I tell my two boys, you're the pastor's kid. Just always say Jesus like 90% of the time. You're gonna be right, don't worry. So <laughs> Jesus <laughs> had, I mean, I think about the fact that he says in the garden, I could call down. I call down an angel right now. I call down legions of angels and wipe everyone out. He says, but instead, I'm gonna stay here and pray and say, Father, if it's your will, I'll take this cup. If it would be your will, let it pass from me. I have the power to call angels and destroy everyone around me, but that's not the will of the Father right now. And praise the Lord, Jesus didn't call the angels down, just destroy everyone to get his way out of the cross. 
Jesus went to the cross because he had a joy that was set before the cross was set before him. He had joy that went beyond an understanding that the will of the Father would bring to fruition salvation for mankind. <laughs> that is meekness. And we look at this and we're being told, man, be careful with the way you speak. And in 11 and 12, it says, he's asking, imagine a spring that does both fresh and bitter water. That doesn't happen. He says, or a fig tree that bears olives or grapevine that bears figs. <laughs> this all assumes a negative answer. Those things aren't normal. Those would be weird things. It's not right. That's why he asks, he says, or he states, thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. As a believer, it's out of character for us if we're yielding the spirit to say anything but good unto the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean it's an easy word. I will tell you, there are times when you have to give a rebuke. Remember, we're not just going around flattering everyone. There is a time and a place for hard words that are rooted in the truth of God, amen? But I'll tell you, you need the wisdom of God, the discernment of God to know when is it time to say this? When is it time to pray about this? When is it time to actually act on these things? And I'll tell you, the Lord has never let me miss those moments because I'm waiting for him to guide me. But I have messed it up by stepping way before he ever called me to. You guys get what I'm saying there? You're never gonna be wrong for taking a moment and praying about it. We're so quick to be like, I'll just say it and then I'll pray for the Lord to forgive me. That's just who I am, not anymore. You're a new creation. I'm just a fighter. I just, you know what? People don't say things I like. I'm gonna get in their face. That's not how you roll anymore. <laughs> now, is there a time to stand for truth? Yes. But I will remind you, everyone wants to talk about Jesus tipping tables over. Yes, he tipped tables two times in three and a half years. Why aren't we using the rule of the rest of Jesus' life? Man, he was patient, meek, prayed up, but absolutely called Herod a fox, <laughs> right? Well, you can look that up. He's basically like, that fox, man, you watch that guy, right? He calls the Pharisees, the religious leaders, a bunch of what, brood of vipers. He calls them hypocrites. He knows when to speak harsh. But Jesus also, man, he had the patience, the meekness that we could only desire to have, and it's only gonna come through the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Man, I don't know where you guys are at this morning, but if people know you for bitter waters, there might be something wrong with the spring. <laughs> and I'll tell you, you might say, well, hey, I'm a fig tree, but your life's barren olives. You can say you're a fig tree all you want. <laughs> There's olives coming out of your life. <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> Jesus says that shouldn't be our, you know, Jesus said absolutely, absolutely we should bear fruit <laughs> that proves what kind of tree we are, right? Matthew 12, 33, either make the tree good and its fruit true, uh, good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. <laughs> so we move from words, look at this last part. This last part moves quickly. Look at 13 through 16. We're gonna see some speech on, on wisdom from James. It says, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above. It's earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. <laughs> this is a heavy word. I keep using that, I know. But we have to understand, it's funny, James is such a practical book. And when you teach on practical things, it hits everyone in the room. <laughs> It's so easy to read through Leviticus and be like, man, I'm glad I'm not a priest. I'm glad I'm not under the old covenant. I'm glad, you start talking about the tongue? Like, holy cow, man, I can't get through a verse without feeling convicted about something. And right off the bat here, he says, do you want to know who's actually wise and understanding? Because many people, including in the church, will say, oh, I'm so wise and understanding now that I'm in the Lord. And so he says, you want to know who actually is? He says, they should show it by good conduct. Fruit. <laughs> The way you live, he just went from speaking to now acting. The way you think, the things in your heart should produce good speech, they should produce good conduct, and it says they should be done in the meekness of wisdom. <laughs> meekness, that might be the word, the buzzword of the morning. Meekness of wisdom. Do you have the wisdom of God? Praise the Lord for that. Do you go around provoking others to fight them over it? That's not meekness. Are you loaded with it to give it when people need it? <laughs> can be meekness. Man, now is the time to give them that word that the Lord has put on my heart. Now is the time to show them through work, 
through the, the things that are coming out of my life, my conduct will prove that I am wise and understanding because it's the Lord that gives such wisdom. He says, but here's the deal. If you have conduct and, and a heart that's bitter, envious, and self-seeking, he says, don't boast and lie against the truth. <laughs> I love that. James is like, don't play. <laughs> don't say that you're of the Lord and doing so great when you're boasting and like you're just rooted in this envy. And see, envy is interesting because envy is not just jealousy. Envy is seeing someone that has something that you want, not just wanting to think you're mad that they have it. <laughs> you hate them for having it. Jealousy is like, man, I wish I had that thing. Now, envy, I wish that person would die because they got that thing and I didn't. <laughs> That's the extreme of envy, Amen. And see, when that stuff is in our heart, you say that doesn't happen in the church, right? <laughs> Can I tell you what happens as a pastor sometimes? Oh, man, I wish I had that guy's ministry over there. I'm not even talking about myself. I've talked to guys with big old ministries that go, man, I still find myself envying other ministries. Sometimes I've realized I got so big, I wish I had that small ministry over there. I'm jealous he has that little ministry. And you go talk to the guy at the little ministry, and he's like, I wish I had that big ministry. Envy, when that starts getting our heart, man, we will mess up everything we've been called to do in the Lord. Man, you put your head down, and you do the things that the Lord called to do right in front of you, amen? And see, you might think, well, that's, that's tough. The pastors deal with that. No one else in the church does that, right? <laughs> Can I tell you what happens when you're serving in ministry? This has happened often. You go, man, that person got chosen for that role. I thought that was gonna be my role. I'm mad about that, <laughs> I'm envious of that. I'm not going to pray for their ministry anymore because I'm so mad that person got the role I wanted. You might say, wow, that's a weird hypothetical. I've been that guy before. On both ends, I think, probably. <laughs> it's funny, I feel like there were so many times where I said, that person's not fit for the role. I would do a better job than them. Does that scare you as your pastor? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just being real with you. James is saying we all stumble in these things. We, you know what changes these things? Yielding to the Spirit. <laughs> I don't have the power to say, man, I just gotta be a better human. This is where my heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, according to Jeremiah 17, nine. The propensity of my heart is to be bitter and envious. I need to take a step back and say, Lord, this isn't right. I'm boasting against the truth. And it says this wisdom, you're calling it wisdom? <laughs> so many times we make excuses. No, I'm telling you the truth. I am the one that should be in that role. I am the one that should be doing this. It's funny, he says, that kind of wisdom, that's not from the Lord. It's earthly sensual and demonic. <laughs> Those are hard words. <laughs> we talk about this, it's like, man, these are not things from the Lord. Wherever we have self-seeking, confusion, and every evil thing are there. When you start doing ministry or serving the Lord for what's in it for you and to further your kingdom, that's gonna lead to evil things and destruction, amen? You should seek the Lord first and foremost. Serve his kingdom, follow him, man. Seek his righteousness, his kingdom. Of all of the things, he'll take care of everything else. You might be in a season, I know there's a lot of people here, they go, man, I left a church where I was so highly involved. I had this, I had that, and the Lord called me out of it, and it's hard. Man, I need that position, I need these things. Look at it, you need the Lord. <laughs> the Lord is good to open those things to you as he sees fit in his timing. He's a God of seasons, I believe. I believe there have been seasons where the Lord says, you're gonna be busy, where you have to rely on me so much. There's been other seasons where it's like, man, I feel like I'm doing nothing. And the Lord says, no, I need you here. I just need you at my feet right now. I need you seeking me so that when that next season comes, you'll be ready. Or maybe the next season is you get to support someone that did what you did before. We all need a Paul to pour into our Timothy, Amen. And we should also be a Paul that pours into Timothy's. There should be this thing as a body where we're supporting, helping, growing together. And none of it should be in self-seeking. Look at how it ends here, 17 through 18. It says, but the wisdom that is from above, so he's gonna contrast earthly wisdom to godly wisdom, is a, the, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. <laughs> that list right there. You might boast, you say, oh man, I'm just, I'm just doing so great in the Lord. Let's take a look at the conduct. Let's take a look at the tongue. Let's see what's coming out of these things. Are there good things coming out of the tongue? Good things coming out of the life that glorify the Lord. In verse 17, he says, the wisdom from above, the very first thing it is, pure. Pure, in this case, speaks of holiness. Set apart behavior because you belong to God who is holy. Amen? 
I'm reading through Leviticus right now in my personal time and it keeps saying things. Remember, you're doing this because God is holy. Do this because God is holy. Why am I doing this? Because I'm holy? No, because God is holy. <laughs> you're serving a master who is holy. He's called you to be pure and then peaceable. You have received the Holy Spirit who gives a peace that surpasses all understanding. In this world, there will be tribulation, but be of good cheer. The Lord has overcome the world and he's given you a peace unlike that fake peace of the world in John 14, 27. All of these things that we need to know and walk in, we know the Lord calls us to be peaceable knowing that, man, we have a peace in the Lord. I don't have to get so upset when someone is refusing to come into the peace of Jesus Christ. My heart breaks. But let me tell you what I have been guilty of. Someone says something bad about the word of God, something about my Lord Jesus, absolutely, it infuriates me because that's my Lord. But then I go, man, I have, to, I have to argue this person into the kingdom. I have to yell at this person. I'm gonna fight this person if I have to. You're like, that's not gentle. <laughs> that's not meekness. That's not, that's not willing to yield to the plan of God. You want to do that, but that might not be what the Lord's calling you to do right now. Maybe he's calling you to pray for that person. Are you so full of wrath all the time that there's no mercy in your life? I have a tendency to move into wrath more than I do into mercy. <laughs> that is our propensity as humans. You first, right? It's me before everyone else. If you offend me, oh, you're getting the wrath. No. Remember, we are told that the kingdom of God belongs to the merciful, right? And that the merciful, oh man, they're gonna receive mercy. <laughs> How do you obtain mercy? By being merciful. <laughs> and then it says here, good fruits coming out of your life without partiality and without hypocrisy. That means you're doing all good things unto everyone. It's not just a certain group. It's not just, well, it's easy to be nice to these people because they're cool with me. <laughs> no, you need to be doing good to all. <laughs> and then it says without hypocrisy. You know what that means? Not saying that you're doing good to all and not really doing it. Like, oh, I'm just gonna say it. Oh, I'm just being so good to everybody and then you find out, no, I'm actually being partial. I'm actually not doing the things I profess to be doing and that puts us on the level of the Pharisees. The Pharisees profess themselves to be masters of the law, the ones that did everything perfect. And the Lord says, you're hypocrites. You study the word all day and yet you miss me. They all testify of me, he said in John 5, 39. God forbid we come here every Sunday and study the, re the revealed word of God and miss Jesus in the process. God forbid. <laughs> you could get so loaded up with the word where you're a big, fat Christian with word, but there's, no, no, there's the only knowledge. There's no wisdom. Knowledge apart from wisdom, knowledge apart from mercy, knowledge apart from grace is a knowledge that puffs up. 1 Corinthians 8.1. There is a knowledge that can become problematic where you think you know everything, and I will tell you I know this because I am that guy way too often. I believe I know everything, and there are people out there that have forgotten more than I know. You know what I mean by that? There are good teachers that I go, oh man, I know nothing, it turns out. I love, I get grounded when I call my old pastor, Pastor Xavier, and I have a Bible question. He like Jedi masters me, and by the time I'm done with the conversation, I'm like, I have 35 new questions about new things from that one verse. I'm like, I know nothing, it turns out. But that's the reality. Like, we should be growing in the word and go, man, I still have room to grow. I don't know everything. If that offends you, that you think you know everything, I just told you you don't, it's time to humble yourself. Seek the Lord. You might have tons of knowledge, but you don't have wisdom, which means how to apply the knowledge. <laughs> You may have studied the Beatitude, chapter five of Matthew so many times, but you're not living it. Someone once said they're Beatitudes because they're supposed to be our attitudes, right? That's not actually what it means, but you know what I mean. We should live these things out. God forbid we become hypocrites, but in verse 18, I love this. The fruit of righteousness, the harvest is sown in peace by those who make peace. <laughs> How is righteousness gonna come forth? Is it immediate? No, it's a process. You have to sow that thing. <laughs> it takes time. It takes consistency. It takes persistency. It takes patience as you peaceably yield to the Lord who says, do this right now. You're like, I don't know if I should do that. I don't, I'm not gonna see the results of that right now. I'd rather just go, out, go off in my wrath. I'd rather just, he says, no, yield to me right now. And then at some point, <laughs> you see it come to fruition. There's this harvest of righteousness in your life. And the only thing you can do is go, man, that's the Lord, <laughs> That the Lord gets the glory, the Lord gets the credit, and it says it's sown in peace by those who make peace. 
Now, this does not call us to be pacifists. People go, if I need to make peace, that means I just never, never get in any kind of hard debate with anyone. I never stand for truth because I gotta make peace. That's not making peace. Man, the Lord is gonna give you the right time, the right moment in his spirit. And you know what? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. It's funny, we're done. I just need to make a note on this. When, (laughs) yeah, I know, famous last words. So Gina was up here earlier, right? And we were talking about the way we get involved. People could potentially say, what is that the church's business? You guys don't need to, it, to be peaceful is to be quiet and submit in Romans 13, man. Can I tell you, there's a time and place for things. Do you know the government works for us, amen? Do you know that you claim to be believers and Christians? And you have an opportunity to use your voice as a steward. And it's so funny, I read a meme the other day by a liberal friend of mine that said, if your pastor tells you how to vote, run from that church. Let me tell you something, every pastor is telling everyone how to vote in the way they teach the Bible. If they don't teach the Bible, they're telling you to vote for garbage. I'm just telling you. Not, maybe they don't say it out loud, but that's what they're promoting. They're saying, do whatever you want. Who cares? You're just animals. <laughs> but when you start teaching the word and say, there is a Lord God in heaven who loves everyone. Everyone was made equal, and he designed them to know him, to love him, and the law exists to preserve and to protect. Do you know that you can bring peace forth by ju- using your voice in the place that we live? Knowing how to use it, but let me be clear. I have seen people get so caught up in these things where, yeah, hey, they're political, great, but they've lost all the meekness and wisdom of the Holy Spirit and of the kingdom of God. I will tell you, we are gonna always preach that balance here, I believe, as we yield to the Holy Spirit. We wanna stand for truth every opportunity we have in the workplace, in our home, in our community, and anyone tells you that you're wrong for that, they're gaslighting you as Christians. (laughs) So you know, Christians aren't supposed to do that. Christians absolutely are called to make peace, to protect, to preserve, following God's order and God's design. And I will tell you this morning, it begins though with a changed heart and a changed tongue. You can go to all the rallies, you can go to all the voting boxes and do all the things, but if you don't have a heart that's changed by Jesus Christ, all you are is a conservative walking into hell. Is that a hard word this morning? I hope a little bit, if your trust is in the conservative Republican Party. I hope you're trusting in Jesus. But I'll tell you what happens when you start to live the Bible. Can I tell you what tends to happen? The Bible leans really conservative. <laughs> you all of a sudden realize that life is life and it's made by God for a purpose. And you realize that God calls for us. Man, when we submit to him, it's just the best thing ever. And may we as a people return to our Lord. Amen? Amen. See, I told you I was done. Why don't you guys stand with me?